Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you a friend and a colleague, and perhaps many of you know him. This is Scott Mahaffey. Uh, Scott uh, is a good friend of Riverside. He, at one point in his uh, multifaceted career, uh, prepared a master landscape plan for Riverside, uh, which, having been on the Landscape Advisory Commission, is something that we look at quite a bit uh, for reference. Uh, Scott was formerly the landscape architect for the Morton Arboretum, uh, in particular during the phase when they started opening up their children's garden, which has been a big hit if you haven't been there lately, and their uh, ecologically correct parking lot and so forth. He was also the landscape architect for the uh, city of Chicago under Mayor Daley too. Uh, and today he has his own business, cleverly named Scott Mahaffey, Inc., <laughs> uh, which um, he does residential uh, and some commercial design. He is uh, a known authority on historic landscapes. You'll see him published a lot and in the uh, uh, American Society of Landscape Architects, he directs one of the historical preservation subcommittees for that. So uh, please join me in welcoming Scott, who's going to talk about Riverside uh, and how its green landscape is, was important then and today. Okay. Can everybody hear okay? Okay, because I'm told this mic is for you. And this is for uh, the TV station, the recording. So uh, I did not do a landscape plan for Riverside. I did a maintenance report. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. There is no landscape plan for Riverside. There are plans, multiple plans, mostly developed by the Olmsted Society and the Landscape Advisory Committee. But that's part of the fascinating evolution of the Riverside landscape, is that there really was no Olmsted plan outside of the general plan. So we'll talk about that a bit. Um, I also was the landscape coordinator uh, for the city of Chicago, not the landscape architect. I was the landscape architect. But um, uh, yeah, that's a, it was another interesting experience. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, but anyway, I'm very happy doing what I'm doing now. I love residential design. And as Kathy said, I love historic um, styles, historic architecture, working with uh, homeowners who want to do something appropriate for the style of their home, the era of their home, and for their community. So I really take pride in doing context-specific uh, or site-specific design. Uh, the little Riverside logo there is uh, from the 1871 um, report. Probably some of you uh, have seen that before. Um, so for those who are visiting uh, Riverside residents, you're going to all know this by heart, of course. Uh, Riverside was begun in 1869, 146 years ago, uh, designed by Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vox, designers of Central Park in New York, uh, considered the first comprehensively planned American suburb. Uh, at the time, it's not how we would comprehensively plan a suburb today, but that's another uh, topic we'll talk about briefly. Um, and it wasn't the first planned suburb in uh, the United States or uh, in the world, so that's something um, that oftentimes uh, gets uh, mistakenly said. It's on the National Register of Historic Places, and it's a National Historic Landmark. It's one of only 2,500 in the United States, which sounds like a big number, but when you think about you know, how old our country is now and the number of historic sites, I think it's pretty significant that Riverside is on that exclusive 2,500 uh, list. So the landscape in Riverside as I said, the formula was something that they kind of made up as they went along. There weren't a lot of examples like this. So 700 of the original 1,600 acre tract was set aside as open space, as public land. And um, that includes, of course, the commons, the triangles, uh, the parkways, um, also the roads, which weren't called streets, they were called roads, of course. That's important to the Riverside uh, concept, to the vision. Um, the curvilinear roads and walks were, of course, intended to convey a rural character and to promote, and this is in Olmsted's own words, leisure, contemplativeness, and happy tranquility. 
And there have been planted since June 1869 47,000 shrubs, 7,000 evergreens, and 32,000 deciduous trees. Uh, so those numbers are maybe a little bit dubious. And, uh, but the point was that uh, the report back to the investors was from the very beginning how important plantings were, how uh, important the landscape was to this concept um, of uh, Riverside, to living in nature and with nature. Now, some of you probably know about new urbanism. Do you all know? Have you heard the expression new urbanism? It's been sort of um, a, re a guiding uh, philosophy toward community design and community redevelopment really since the 1980s, but gaining a lot of steam in the past few years. And it's really focused on creating walkable communities, on uh, preserving open space, making sure that parks and open space are within easy walking distance of every resident. But it also has a, 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 a strongly democratic social formula, which is to integrate uh, housing of various types at various price levels and to create employment opportunities for people in the community of various skill sets. Um, and also to think about regional design, uh, contextual design, connecting uh, communities um, through public transit, through bike trails, uh, uh, connecting open space, creating green corridors. Um, now, Riverside, of course, gets checks in all boxes, and it was done a century and a half ago. So really, there's so much to learn and has been learned from Riverside over the years. So despite the fact that people have complained that there wasn't enough of a commercial district or um, some of the other things maybe that you could find fault with, um, Riverside really was a forerunner of uh, new urbanism in so many ways. It's old urbanism, if you will. And um, I'm going to really focus today on uh, a few of these, in specific um, the range of public spaces and support of the public realm and then um, also designing around respect for local heritage and cultural traditions, and how couldn't you focus on that when you're talking to folks who live in a 150-year-old community. So I want to start by dispelling a few myths, and three to be specific. Number one, Riverside was designed by the father of American landscape architecture. Well, that's not entirely true if you think about it. Um, Fred was only 46 years old at the time. There was no landscape architecture profession. He kind of invented it. At the time, landscape architects were called landscape gardeners. Uh, Calvin Vox was only, uh, or Calvert Vox was only 44 years old. So they were very young. And as I said, they were kind of making this up as they went along. Um, they were noted for being the designers of Central Park. So the improvement company, uh, knew what they were getting. In fact, they went specifically to the foremost park designers. Uh, who better to design a villa park um, than the foremost park designers of the day? Um, but they really owed a lot to this man, Andrew Jackson Downing. And if you know Victorian history at all, you know the importance of Andrew Jackson Downing. Um, Calvert Vox worked for Andrew Jackson Downing. That's where Frederick Law Olmsted met him in, Vox, in uh, Downing's office. But Downing was uh, a romantic era designer. He was a passionate and energetic man. He was sort of the HGTV of his day. He was out there promoting through his writings and speaking uh, the importance of quality residential design, quality home design, quality landscape design, community design for the betterment of the human spirit, for the betterment of human behavior. Uh, a lot of people of his era believed that a lot of social ills could be um, cured through uh, encouraging um, neighborly interactions, encouraging a sense of community. And um, so here we see sort of uh, some of Downing's writings about landscape. And if you read this, of course, it sounds like he's describing Riverside, you know, this sort of naturalistic design theory, planting in groups uh, to heighten and adorn rather sparse landscapes. That certainly was the case here but not to shut out and obstruct the beauty of prospect uh, which nature has placed before your eyes. So intricacy and variety in plantings would be uh, where there's not a broad view or a vista. You're creating interest in the foreground. Um, so again, uh, Olmsted and Vox were very influenced by Downing and Downing's thinking. Uh, he wrote Victorian Cottage Residences. It was 
circulated uh, all over the United States, um, and, and also uh, the architecture of country houses, but also the horticulturist magazine um, was very influential in its day. So here are some of the uh, pattern book designs from Victorian cottage residence. Looks a lot like some of the early houses here in Riverside, designed by Calvert Vox and uh, William LeBaron Jenny. Um, and, and Jenny was very important to the uh, early development of Riverside. You probably know that the improvement company had financial uh, troubles and an opportunity came along for Olmsted and Vox to design the South Park, which later became Jackson Park, Washington Park, and the Midway Plaisance. And they had money uh, appropriated through the state, and so it was a good time to kind of part ways. Well, unfortunately, the only thing that really existed was the general plan. There weren't a lot of detailed plans done for Riverside at the time that Olmsted and Vox departed. So a lot of the implementation fell on the shoulders of uh, Jenny and Shermerhorn, his business partner, both of whom had houses on Scottswood Common. Um, they were Riverside's resident engineers, if you were, although certainly much more than that. They were well-known and respected practitioners in their day. But Olmsted oftentimes gets a lot of the credit maybe where he doesn't deserve it. Um, but that aside, myth number two then, Olmsted designed a landscape master plan for Riverside, and he didn't. The, here is the plan, right here in front of you, the general plan. Um, trees weren't specified, habitats weren't specified. In fact, the only real uh, record of Olmsted's thinking when it comes to specific plantings, he was taking a train back from the west and going across northern Michigan, and he was writing a letter to Mary, his wife, and he was saying that uh, white birch and pines might work in the sandy soil of a specific triangle, triangular park, uh, north along the Long Common. But if you think about it, you know, that's just a reference in a letter. <laughs> he didn't have the opportunity to design planting plants. Now, Kathy Sleuth Maloney has discovered an Olmsted plan that he did for an early residence here in Riverside. That came a little bit later but uh, at least out of Olmsted's office. But of course, here's the other reason. Only two-thirds of the general plan uh, could be realized because the Western Third didn't belong to the improvement company. So uh, interesting, as you, of course, go beyond the superficial, as Riverside residents, you, of course, embody this history. You really know it. But it's really fascinating, of course, you start pulling threads and gain a deeper understanding and appreciation for, you know, how special the community is, despite these early fits and starts. You know, it came out to be something really spectacular. Um, so Riverside in the 1880s looked a little bit like this, and in the foreground, uh, you see one of the old fence rows from Gage's Farm, but largely undeveloped, a lot of street trees, and people moved large trees back then. Now, Gage had a nursery on his farm, so it's likely that a lot of these larger trees came right here from the property and were moved. And of course, as, the pro as roads were installed and so forth, um, they would have had to transplant trees, kind of dig them and drag them to the side, replant them. Um, and of course, no doubt, as landscape architects do today, there was a very good tree survey and topographic survey, and the roads were laid in around some of the pre-settlement oaks that existed at that time. Now here's what the houses looked like in the 1880s. Not a lot of landscaping around those either, and for good reason. I think that there was always this aesthetic, this prevailing aesthetic in Riverside, especially from the early days that we were moving to the country, that you were creating a idyllic rural environs. And if you look at contemporary landscapes in Hinsdale or Park, Ark Park for example, um, you'd see much lusher landscapes, much more typically Victorian. But that wasn't the prevailing aesthetic here. That's really not why people came to Riverside. Of course, you could also argue that, much as in our recent history, these folks may have been, in some cases, a little house poor. Um, that might not have been a high priority. And if you read about the role of women in that day, that they were oftentimes the, uh, the, the keeper of the checkbook, the run, they'd be given an allowance to run the uh, home, and uh, you know the, the uh, phrase home economics came out of this area, era because uh, oftentimes uh, women took great pride in their ability to uh, balance the needs of the family, uh, to uh, meet the financial obligations, to be thrifty and economical. And so um, I think a lot of times uh, plants were sort of dug in from the countryside. Yes? Are any of those houses Local historians. I would think at least a couple of them. 
but um, as you know, a lot of uh, houses in Riverside date from the um, 20s and 30s and later, so it's likely that some of the wood frame structures were uh, removed. Um, and I have to say that these specific photographs, probably some of you know, when Heidegger's was uh, being demolished, they found a box of glass plates and reprinted them. And so I was lucky enough to get uh, copies of some of those photographs. So some of these have never been printed. Um, some of them appear in Lonnie and Connie's book um, from a couple years ago. But um, it's fascinating, of course, if you go to the I Grew Up in Riverside blog. Is that the person here, by the way, who maintains that blog? But it's a fascinating blog, and it's a great repository for historic photographs. And so if you have things like this, share it. Get them you know, saved in a place where they're accessible to people. Um, and then here we see, uh, about 10 years later, Riverside in the 1890s. And by this, then, this sort of established landscape style, we see really this sort of uh, English landscape school, um, mainly uh, borrowing from uh, landscape paintings probably know the uh, school of the beautiful, the picturesque, and the sublime. And Riverside in general was a beautiful landscape. It was a pastoral setting. But along the river and in other places, it was a little wilder, a little rougher, so borrowing principles of the picturesque. Um, and so uh, people understood, I think, at this time that their front yards were part of the community, that my front yard connects to the parkway, connects to the triangles, connects to the uh, common, connects to the park. So the continuity, the aesthetic, being a good community member meant that you didn't trash up the front of your yard with a lot of gauche plantings, that you adhered to, and in the, in the feeling of community uh, spirit, you would landscape your yard in a similar way. So myth number three, Riverside was intended to have a prairie style landscape. And I'm not loaded for bear on this one, but some of you <laughs> may take a uh, challenge with this. And so what I'm saying, though, is that the prairie style of landscape gardening wasn't even labeled until 1915. So you couldn't say that Olmsted wanted Riverside to have a prairie style landscape. He w was not on the scene, uh, wasn't alive at that time. It would be next to impossible. Um, the Prairie Spirit, uh, though, of landscape gardening was a circular, free circular, that was published by the University of Illinois Agricultural Extension by Wilhelm Miller, who was a landscape architect and a horticultural writer, a landscape uh, uh, writer. And um, he had this idea that, as did the University of Illinois, that we're going to keep people on the farm. This was the uh, rural improvement era. Um, and uh, this was part of that spirit, uh, not to get off on a tangent, but uh, interestingly, though, some photographs taken in 1913, 1914 appear uh, in this publication that were taken here in Riverside. So we see, for example, flowering hawthorn trees that over the course of 50 years uh, had really you know, grown into their maturity. F a flowering plum at the edge of the woods, we see a couple uh, months later, um, flowering elderberry along the river. And certainly the Babson estate, the Coonley estate, had largely been completed by the time by Jens Jensen. So there was certainly a prairie style, even though if it wasn't called that, um, it was by that time starting to be seen here in Riverside. Um, it's interesting to look at these views from the 1890s versus the 1990s and see how not only had things matured and the canopies were higher, the trunks were bigger, but the general impression was much more pastoral. And so if we lived in Riverside in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, we might have this idea, of course, in our mind that this is what it was intended to be. But if you look back at the earlier photographs and you look um, uh, at uh, uh, some, of the, uh, uh, some of the earliest photographs from the 1880s and 90s, you see it wasn't this pastoral quality. It was much more rustic, much more country living. And so when the Olmsted uh, uh, Committee, uh, the, the Landscape Advisory Committee, you know, really kind of took it upon themselves to sort of fill in the blanks, to frame these views with shrubbery and with a shrub layer, an understory layer, things that didn't exist at that time. So really, a lot of this has been done in uh, the past 20, 25 years. Thanks to some folks probably in this room, but uh, John Kohler and John Kunkka and others really sort of led the charge to um, sort of create this more painterly landscape that we know today. Um, so palimpsest, how many of you know that word? 
So a palimpsest is something, uh, traditionally it's been a writing surface. Back when vellum was actually animal skin and paper was very rare, of course they'd have to clean off the writing surface to use it again. But always there would be vestiges of a previous use. And one very famous um, uh, example is uh, this uh, 13th century prayer book at the top, which has remnants of uh, Archimedes' 10th century scientific notations. That's a very famous palimpsest. There are lots of them. Um, of course, x-ray, um, x-raying old paintings, we, saw, we see previous paintings. So this is Picasso's uh, old guitarist right here at the, from the Art Institute. And you can see that a few years ago, uh, an x-ray revealed that there's another Picasso painting underneath. And of course, that's another example of a palimpsest. Well, the landscape, of course, is just like that. You know, we see layer upon layer of different thinking and changes and evolution of, over time. And so thinking about the Riverside landscape, it's not like, you know, a theme park, for example, where it was completed, the doors were open, everybody walked in, and you can say, well, okay, that's the period of significance. You know, that's exactly what it was intended to be because Riverside evolved over time. And so we start unraveling the threads and we look at the work of the CCC in the 1930s and we look at various changes to the landscape where there was construction of the village hall, um, the construction of the library, revetments along the river, uh, filling of the, uh, around the picnic island, various changes that have happened over time. And of course, these things have happened in our own lifetime as well. You know, the Hoffman Dam notching, the changes to the Swan Pond and the old Picnic Island area. So the riverside landscape keeps evolving. So where do we go to sort of unravel the past? And one of the best places, of course, is to start where the past is present and really go to those historic sites that haven't changed or have been preserved and start to take a deeper level of understanding. Start looking at historic photographs, engravings, documents that really uh, help us develop a deeper understanding of how these places came to be and then how they changed over time and then trying to understand, of course, why they changed. The social and political factors, the improved technology, whatever it is that caused the uh, sites to evolve and change over time. Now, again, looking back at the 1871 report, a lot of these engravings were conveying design intent, maybe, and giving the investors a sense that maybe more had been accomplished <laughs> than it really had. Um, but they do give us maybe a sense of what might have been accomplished if finances had been better and if Olmsted and Vox had been allowed to stay on the job and develop more detailed uh, plans and construction uh, here at Riverside. But that's not reality. But of course, um, there are, as I said, um, examples. Uh, the Sh Shermerhorn's own home along Scottswood Common, uh, the Dora residence, of course, very important, uh, designed by Vox uh, next to uh, the church. Um, uh, and thinking about even smaller monuments throughout the village that you can use as a landmark in historic photos, and they're still there today, and you can sort of track, you know, how the landscape grew and changed over time. Um, and then, of course, people. I mean, people have always lived in this community, made their own mark, but living in the landscape, living that idyllic rural setting close to the conveniences of the city, that has always remained, you know, one of the key attractions of Riverside. Um, I think it's fun um, and interesting, uh, but uh, makes us better historians, better residents, when we also think about what the landscape looked like when Frederick Law Olmsted first saw it in the summer of 1868. So he would have seen a white oak savanna. He would have seen uh, Baroque bottomlands, the Des Plaines River, meandering Prairie River before it was developed, uh, cattle grazing, um, it was a sand barren. So a, lo a lot of you know about the Riverside Spit. Maybe that was discussed this morning. That as Lake Michigan receded over the millennia, there is an ancient uh, beach ridge that goes through Riverside and through Com Columbus Park, actually. And of course, before um, development, when the cattle were grazing at Gage's Farm, the sand was very close to the surface. The humus layer was built up over the course of the 20th century with mown lawn and leaf debris because it was all landscaped and, of course, mulching. So those sandy soils, if you live in the area of the Long Common, for example, you know that uh, you've got sandier soils or maybe along the river, but in other areas it would be heavy clay. Well, Rivers uh, uh, Olmsted, of course, um, knew about uh, these conditions because he had worked on Jackson Park, um, as I said, contemporaries, 
uh, contemporaneous with Riverside. And uh, we know through some of his writings um, about Columbus Park uh, that he didn't think very much of the landscape, <laughs> that he had a, a typical Easterner's perspective that maybe didn't uh, value some of the sort of placid qualities of the prairie. He thought that the lake was first and foremost the most attractive um, aspect of the Chicago uh, area. Um, also sort of bemoaned that he was dealing with these sort of scrub trees um, that had uh, managed to, these oaks were smaller than what he'd seen on the East Coast because they were growing in wet sandy soils all the time. So he was trained as a surveyor and as a civil engineer and he knew that one of the first things they have to do is drain the land to uh, make it buildable and make it habitable for trees. And, and so of course, in some ways, some of that early work was done here at Riverside but there were several smaller farmsteads scattered around this property. You probably know that pre-development. Um, the Wisencraft residence on Pine Avenue was moved, I think, just slightly to the north to get out of the alignment of the street. But if we look at this, um, this is before R Riverside was platted. And Olmsted would have uh, driven by the Wisencraft farm. He would have known, uh, because he laid out his own farm and others, how a farmstead, where you site the house, um, where you plant a windbreak, these white pines growing to the northwest of the house, for example, <laughs> blocking the winds across the prevailing uh, prairie winds from the northwest, but also telling him that this sandy, well-drained soil could support a pine. So you know, he, being a good landscape architect, um, would have seen the way that uh, settlers, early settlers, before the village of Riverside was actually platted, uh, what they were doing with the land, how they lived on the land, lived with the land. But of course, he was also influenced by his travels in England and throughout the American South. And he writes um, and walks and talks of an American in England, which was published in 1815. Probably you know that, Rivers, uh, that uh, Olmsted had several careers before becoming a landscape architect. Um, he was uh, a, an author, a social commentator. Uh, he was a farmer. Um, he was a bit of a, a surveyor and uh, civil engineer, amateur civil engineer. Um, you know, he was politically active, um, socially conscious. Uh, he was really ahead of his time in so many ways. But he writes about uh, the logging, the tree cutting that was happening in Epping Forest. So we know that early as 1850 and before, he felt very strongly about preserving old trees, big trees, doing sensitive development to manage forests so they uh, would last well into the uh, next generation, the coming generations. He also was fascinated by these Victorian uh, railroad suburbs like uh, Summerlayton. Um, we have documentation that he visited there. And so he, this was new technology. This was new living. To, you know, people who were uh, of means could get out of the uh, pollution of the city and live in the country, but within an easy commute to the city. Blaise Hamlet in Bristol, there were several of these sort of idealized um, uh, uh, estate villages throughout England. And certainly we know that this influenced the way that his thinking was about using vernacular building traditions, rustic homes set within the landscape, linked with the topography. Um, and so certainly those thoughts, of course, came to the uh, drafting board when he was uh, working on the uh, design of Riverside as well. Well, he would have known Llewellyn Park. This was a very famous development done in 1853 um, by Andrew uh, Jackson Davis, who was a good friend uh, and collaborator of Andrew Jackson Downing. He was an architect. I think it's really fascinating to look at the uh, gatehouse there and how similar it is you know, to the uh, pumping stations here in Riverside, which were done about 45 years later. But um, Llewellyn Park was different from Riverside in that um, the lots were generally about three acres. It, Thomas uh, Edison had a home there. I mean, it was a very wealthy community. And, and Olmsted, even uh, in 1868, even though uh, the lots were bigger initially, he had, and he writes about, the importance of having um, uh, a diverse community. He didn't use those words, but in having a, a group of people from all walks of life, uh, having a, a richly layered community, um, he felt uh, that the folks who lived in Riverside would be uh, intellectual, uh, that they would want to uh, raise their children in this sort of community, that they would want to be uh, involved socially with the community. Um, so the sort of social programming that underlays the development of these planned suburbs was very important. Um, component of their design. So Olmsted also, of course, would have been familiar with Swain Nelson's uh, the first plan of Lincoln Park from 1865. 
uh, being implemented at th that time. Of course, a lot of this has been erased over subsequent redevelopments of uh, Lincoln Park. And Elmer and Hotchkiss's uh, pl general plan for Lake Forest from 1856, which, by the way, there's another you know, little um, example of the fact that Riverside wasn't the first. It was just maybe the best of its time. I mean, both of these are very Victorian, very garden-esque. If you see these sort of uh, almost forced curves in the paths and roads. And I think Olmsted was a, a, a much better landscape architect um, because he understood grading, he understood topography, he understood landform, and he knew where to build roads and paths that, that would last. So there were sort of functional reasons for them to be rather than just creating a, a pretty plan. Um, so myth versus reality. If we go back to that 1871 report and we look at some of those engravings, you know, again, how much of them looked like this? You know, um, we know, for example, there was no rustic bridge uh, connecting to the Picnic Island. If you look at Jan, uh, Lonnie and Connie's book, you'll see that there was a tree felled over the stream, and for many years people walked that log. Um, and, but if you look at his writings, you know, Olmsted's trying to get Vox excited about this new project because, um, as Vox later said, you know, it's sort of a bit of a kite flying, you know, exercise because they were giving lots instead of payment, and Vox and Olmsted both had young families, needed money at that time, so I think at various times they were critical of each other. Um, but uh, he was trying to get Vox interested, and he said, oh, there are going to be so many opportunities, not only for designing houses, but rustic pavilions and rustic bridges and, and you know, so uh, docks, you know, uh, uh, places where we can watch um, uh, races along the river and so forth. So, you know, that gives us a hint, had he stayed on, and also if we go to the restored uh, parts of uh, Central Park, Prospect Park, some of the uh, Olmsted projects from the uh, late 19th century, probably some of that rustic pole structure architecture would have been here, but it wasn't. So that's part of the myth versus reality, just sort of taking a responsible um, citizen's hat and saying, okay, I'm going to really understand what is authentically Riverside. Not what the hype or promotions were basically saying in the early years, but what really came to be. Okay, so number one, this is a reality check here. <laughs> Riverside is a constructed landscape. It is a subdivision. It's a giant subdivision. If you want, it, you could, if you want to be really snarky about it, you could say it's a theme park because it was. It was a giant park, and the theme was naturalism. The thing was, was the theme was. I'm going to attract buyers here by creating this great pastoral English landscape that you can own a piece of. You don't have to be landed gentry um, to be able to enjoy this uh, beautiful pastoral uh, landscape scenery. So it's artifice from the beginning, but very sophisticated artifice. Um, reality number two, nothing lasts forever. Great uh, humility and hubris comes from realizing that neither trees or people last you know, forever. So in order to keep uh, Riverside going, and in order to keep this uh, vision going, um, you've got to play a part. You know, as a resident, you've got to plant trees, you've got to get out there and volunteer for landscape work days, and you've got to, of course, cultivate and foster the next generation constantly so that there's always, uh, you know, another uh, generation coming up who understands what Riverside was intended to be and, and what it is today and why. Um, Reality number three, change is constant and inevitable. It's happening all around us. If we look at these early photos of the landscape in Riverside and we start saying, okay, well, the gas light looks different. And, you know, those roads are gravel. It looks like they were doing even sewer utility work <laughs> even back then. But, um, you know, and then you start saying, oh, gosh, yeah, the sand. There's an eroded area there where the sand was close to the surface. Why isn't that the case anymore? And look how much bigger that oak you know, is than the surrounding trees. You know, that's a pre-settlement oak. That was here before Riverside. You know, so you, you start unraveling the story of the landscape, how it evolved over time, and you want to go stand on that same spot and photograph the same view and start seeing if any of those trees are still there and understanding, you know, how, how does the landscape feel then versus now? Um, you know, reality number four is there really is a Riverside landscape style. Every so often, there's this sort of movement in Riverside to plant a lot of flowers and to dial things up. And I call it sort of, you know, poking your nose over the hedge one too many times. We go shopping in downtown Hinsdale. We go up to Lake Forest, and we're like, well, we want this. 
But that's not what Riverside is. You know, it's not good to maybe, you can always get some great ideas for community involvement, for programming, special events. But if anything, you know, if you're a dedicated community member, you want to make more of what Riverside already is, not try to adopt what other communities are doing that may not be appropriate for Riverside's style or history or cultural traditions. And reality number five, there's no place like home. Now, it's not open prairie uh, at the end of the block anymore. You know, it's the noise and chaos of the city and the surrounding suburbs. And, you know, you only have to pull off of Harlem Avenue into Riverside, of course, today to realize how important this is, this notion of living in and with nature is, you know, even today, probably even more so. So um, thinking about uh, Olmsted's uh, and the 19th century uh, sort of um, uh, social uh, improvement thinking that living in nature makes people better, raising children in this sort of environment makes them better citizens. Um, it's just healthier for the psyche. Um, you know, I think uh, we realize just uh, how special this place is. People live here. <laughs> People have different ideas of what, a land, what landscaping should be, what the community should be, what uh, a prosperous or healthy or sustainable community should be. And that's changed throughout time. So again, having this, this hubris, this uh, modesty to realize that we're not always going to get our way, but that we're going to make our voices be heard, that we're going to sit at the table, we win some, we lose some, but that that's part of the process. By living here, you, you, you know, you've got to participate. You've got, if you, these things are important to you, you've got to you know, stand up and take a stand uh, when they're uh, endangered or threatened, and you've got to roll up your shirt sleeves and help maintain it. There was a time not so long ago when you know, a lot of this sort of Olmsteadian vision was nearly lost. Those of you who were lived here in Riverside in the 50s and 60s, you know the landscape looked a lot like this. But it wasn't just Riverside, of course. The Chicago parks looked like this. It's sort of uh, uh, mid-century mentality um, of uh, open, well-maintained lawns, get rid of the shrub layer, who knows what could be lurking back there. Um, you know, to be modern in this time meant something very different than uh, what being modern means today. Um, and this is, of course, what being modern means today. This is what the next generation wants, and Riverside's ahead of its time, I think. So um, being committed to um, maintaining the shrub layer and the herbaceous layer and keeping this sort of uh, country retreat, this sort of uh, pastoral and picturesque at various points in the landscape, it takes a lot of work. You know that. Um, but it's what makes Riverside what it is. You know, it makes the Riverside landscape unique. It uh, is a unique character among other suburbs, not only in the Chicago area, but in the region and in the nation. And there are challenges into this. I'm not going to get into politics, but just as a Riverside resident, you know, every decade there's a new challenge. You know, we get federal funding for curbs and gutters. You know, they want us to take out the gas lights in the 1970s. Um, you know, the Burlington Avenue streetscape. I'm, you know, I don't really know a lot about this, but I know it's been a very controversial issue. The south uh, half of the Coonley Main House, the fact that it's falling apart. There are community treasures everywhere. These are just two examples that, you know, I think the community has to come together and take a stand and really um, make sure that the right thing is done. Uh, we talked a little bit about this, contemporary challenges, poking your nose over the fence a little, you know, one, two, um, often there's a formula oftentimes, I think, for these successful downtowns. And I think, if anything, it's a tragedy if Riverside becomes formulaic. You know, don't just look at downtown LaGrange and say, okay, well, we've got to have three different sizes of planters, and you've got to have planters at every 20 feet intervals, and I have to use this paper brick. I mean, this is terrible. It's it's really happening throughout uh, suburbia, and it's happened throughout the city of Chicago. And these things look dated very quickly, and they look very generic after a while. So uh, I just hope that that doesn't happen in Riverside. So where do we go from here? Ha ha. <laughs> Pardon the pun. Um, OK. So stay committed to community. Of course, that's very important. You who are longtime residents of Riverside uh, know the importance of this, uh, staying involved not being isolated, not losing yourself in frustrated, frustration and walking away from the table. Um, preserve and promote. So if you live here in Riverside, uh, chances are you think it's a pretty special place. And you need to let others know, of course, 
that it is, inviting guests in. I think the Right Plus tour was a big success this summer, brought folks to Riverside who normally wouldn't come here, people from Japan, Spain, all over the world. So finding opportunities to leverage, it, leverage resources. Um, and there's a lot of, it doesn't have to be Prairie Style or Prairie School or Franklin Wright, there's a lot of wonderful architecture, wonderful architectural treasures here in Riverside. And um, of course, finding more opportunities to get people to come and experience the community um, is a great source of uh, community pride and promotion. And you really never know what will come from these things. A learn and teach. There are so many wonderful opportunities. You know, the Morton Arboretum is just a few minutes away. There are tons of classes. You know, there are tons of uh, great examples of restoration ecology, of woodland management, of naturalistic landscape design for homeowners. Um, so what a wonderful resource to have uh, just down the road. And um, I think that if you, as a Riverside resident, can challenge yourself to become um, uh, you don't have to become a professional restoration ecologist, but even to become a better gardener by understanding native plants and their soil and moisture requirements or light requirements, um, their associates, you know, the plant communities that they evolved in w over time, it's going to make you a better gardener as well. Celebrate. I mean, this is a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful event, and there should be more like it. I mean, um, so, uh, of course, celebrate where you live, celebrate the Olmsted legacy, celebrate the Riverside legacy. Here's just a little cartoon from The New Yorker from uh, a couple years ago. But uh, it doesn't have to be Central Park, although Central Parks talk about a wonderful example of uh, a landscape that has taken uh, decades to restore, but now is, of course, uh, heavily uh, endowed and protected uh, because people of uh, multiple generations saw the importance of this. And so I don't know if there is a landscape uh, restoration or uh, protection fund here in Riverside, but certainly it's um, needed. So here are just a few um, examples of further reading, some suggested reading. It's not necessarily for Riverside residents. You probably know all of these uh, inside and out, but for those who are visiting, I'd encourage you to take advantage of some of these resources. Of course, the library has everything about Olmstead, so this is just the tip of the iceberg, but um, thank you so much, and I'd certainly welcome uh, questions, comments, interaction, appreciate it. <laughs> Kathy. That's funny because, um, and Charlie knows this, this has actually been a debate among landscape architects for generations now. Um, in fact, one of my good friends, he was a college student um, at the time and he made this poster and it was something about uh, landscape, it was Olmsted's picture and very patriotic looking and it said something about landscape architecture, the profession hamstrung by uh, dead white men or something very controversial. <laughs> but I'm like, I gotta get to know this person, you know, this is wild. But I mean, every so often this comes up in landscape architecture about, you know, like if you're constantly, you know, venerating Olmsted, you don't move on as a profession. And usually the, re the response is, it's not either or, it's both and. You know, you will become a better landscape architect if you really take time to understand Olmsted and understand its design principles and understand um, uh, Downing and understand Repton and understand the English Landscape School and understand the evolution of your own profession. You know, so um, I think even if you're not an historian and you don't work on historic properties, um, by taking time to understand that um, history, it's going to make you a better contemporary practitioner. Um, in Olmsted and in Riverside specifically, um, it's always been that battle, and it's ridiculous because other than that one little letter to Mary and uh, the general plan, we don't really have any kind of documentation. So then you say, okay, 
at one level or another, it's conjecture. Now, if you're Charlie Beveridge or Vicki Ranney, you can conjecture better than the average Joe, probably. But the point is that I think if you look at other um, Olmsted communities uh, and Olmsted parks from that time and from shortly thereafter, um, you probably gain a pretty good contextual knowledge for making informed decisions uh, here in Riverside. And when I talked about sort of like the formula, they're making it up as they went along, you know, if you did a, a general plan or a master plan for a new suburb today, there would be a huge financial program and you would look at the commercial tax base and you'd understand what percent of commercial taxes you needed to offset property taxes and so forth and you'd look at uh, controlled growth over time and certainly you would make sure that uh, public transit was available and so forth. Those weren't concerns here. I mean, it, it, you can't fault Olmsted for not knowing, or you can't fault people in 18, you know, 68, 1869 for not doing what we would do today. Did I answer that question? Okay. I have a cold, by the way. Sorry. <laughs> I think that's right. I mean, well, I mean, there are other Olmsted, there are other Olmsted communities, and the way, of course, that um, Olmsted designed Riverside is much more reminiscent, of course, of his work in Central Park and Prospect Park in the Chicago parks um, than some of the work that the uh, Olmsted brothers did, or Olmsted, Olmsted, and Elliot. You know, the later, the later work of the firm didn't have this quality of the sort of pastoral English landscape, you know, it was much more um, uh, influenced by what professional landscape architecture was in the 1920s, the 19, yeah, the late 1920s, 30s, so I think that in a, in a sense that's very true. Um, the Great Depression that hit at the time of plan was developed, what sort of devastation did that occur? Because on your plan map it showed a large section of what we call Hollywood and Brookfield. That's right. Um, did that spiral down and just get eliminated, or what was the sequence of that? No, I don't think the improvement company ever owned that land, did they? The Western Third, basically, Hollywood subdivision, subdevelopment. I mean, no, no, I don't think the improvement company ever owned that land, so. Yeah, gross, exactly. And if you read Kathy's book, Chicago Gardens, there's a great little chapter in there. And actually, there's, not to get up on a tangent, but there's actually an interesting story. You probably know that Edith Rockefeller McCormick owned some land like the Maplewood subdivision and some of Brookfield as well. And she was a kook. She was a very interesting person. But she, uh, Edwin Crenn, who was her sort of boy toy, who had his own boy toy, but that was a whole other story. Um, <laughs> He, she kept Crenn busy, basically, by giving him these projects, and so he designed parts of Maplewood subdivision and I think maybe some over in Brookfield, and, and she was designing this huge Edithton, Edithton Beach uh, subdivision up north and uh, kept borrowing money from her brother and eventually cut her off, and it was a big mess. But anyway, um, that's kind of tangential, but fascinating that, you know, that could have been a part, certainly part of Riverside. Um, had uh, financial problems not been what they were, and political problems, you know, maybe Emory Childs wasn't the right man for the job. Um, <laughs> and, and, and also going back to the fact that Olmsted was only 40 years old. He had a young family with mouths to feed, so did Calvert Vox. They couldn't afford to work for free. It was a long way, you know, from Boston to Chicago, from New York to Chicago, and, um, you know, they had to move on to other opportunities. So, and I apologize to folks in the room who know more than I do about some of these things. I just, I'm, I'm so thankful uh, that you invited me to speak today.